Okay, so um, this morning I was talking about one-dimensional maps and trying to make this connection between um, what we know about smooth maps, which we've been working on for a long, long time, and how the um, piecewise smooth case can be sort of thought about in the same types of way. And I had this slide with a sort of set of the types of results that one gets in the smooth case and the techniques that we had. And one thing that's worth saying about the techniques is that things like Markov partitions, bifurcation theory, ergodic theory, renormalization, and ideas of expansion all carry over relatively straightforwardly to higher dimension. Okay, so all these ideas, except needing theory, have very simple um, extensions, well, simple, they're more complicated, but um, they can all be extended to higher dimensions. The tricky one is needing theory, and as we'll see, quite a lot of what one can do that's really powerful in one dimension comes through needing theory. And as I've already said, bifurcation theory has very, very special features in the smooth case which aren't present in the non-smooth case or piecewise smooth case. So these two have trouble. Okay. So I was going to look at an example of that result about what the importance of periods 2 to the n are in the unimodal case and actually in the continuous case in general. I'm going to say that a map is chaotic if it has a topological horseshoe. I'll say a lot more about that in a minute, but for the moment, we say that a map F has a topical, topological horseshoe if I can find an interval, and here's the diagonal, such that two branches of that map cover the interval completely. And I don't care how, but they have to be two continuous branches. Okay, so the map could go, you know, anything like that, as long as it's continuous. It could go dip into the box, I don't care about that. That could come down here, and so on. But the fact that I've got a branch here and a branch here, the image of this branch is the whole set, the image of this branch is the whole set, and so I have two branches that cover the interval. Now, if you has anyone yet looked at um, the tent map with slope two? Did anyone do that one? I've done that one. So that's a, This is an example, or two x mod one. These are very simple examples where you can. Um, show that there are topological horseshoes because the image of this set is the whole set, the image of this set is the whole set, and so on. Slight complication here about open closed at the endpoints, but we won't worry about that. So my definition of a topological horseshoe, which I'll write down a bit later, but I want to get this moving through, is that some branch f to the n has a topological horseshoe. Okay, so there exists an n such that f to the n has a topological horseshoe. As we'll see in a minute, the type of thing that a topological horseshoe implies is the existence of uncountably many um, different topological types of orbits, um, infinitely many periodic orbits, and so on. So it's a sort of, and it's a sort of simplification of the two-dimensional L horseshoe. Okay, so I'll say the map is chaotic if it has a topological horseshoe. So, oops. So that's if some iterate of it has this two-branch property and symmetric tent map with slope greater than two. If I have slope greater than two, or actually greater than or equal to, but if I have slope greater than or equal to two, then it goes out of the box and I've got two branches here and here which map each map over the entire. Okay. And this isn't talking about stable things, it's simply talking about the existence of complicated trajectories. And I'll say a fixed point is orientation reversing, or it's an orientation reversing fixed point, ORFP, if the map is decreasing at the fixed point. Okay, so slope negative. So here's an example of that. This fixed point is decreasing. And what you can see is that if I start anywhere, I spiral in. So in fact, the iterates are going 
from the left to the right to the left to the right to the left to the right. You're switching sides each time you're iterating close to the stationary point. Okay, so in that case, it's a stable ORFP, but I'm not, I don't care whether it's stable or unstable. So these are the two definitions I'm going to use. These are the only two definitions I'm going to use in what I'm going to say next. Okay, so chaotic if there are basically two branches that go across the entire um, interval, and typical simple cases, one of them would be like that, and the other is the orientation reversing version of that, would be like that. Okay, in this case, this branch and this branch both map over the union, well, map over the entire interval that I've got there, and this branch and this branch map over the entire interval that I've got there. Which is enough to show that in that interval there are chaotic orbits. And the ORFP. Okay, so remember we were doing you know, deep mathematics, so the first thing is, Let's think about unimodal maps that look like this. The first thing is a dichotomy. Either there is an orientation reversing fixed point, or there is not. If there's no orientation reversing fixed point, that means for the unimodal map, there's no equivalent of this point here. If you think about what that means, it means that the map effectively lies below the diagonal. If the unimodal map went above the diagonal initially, it would have to turn around and come back down, and so it has an orientation reversing fixed point. So it basically means that the map is below, and if the map is below after one iteration, it's on the monotonic increasing below the um, diagonal part, and then all iterates thereafter will tend directly to the origin, so the origin is stable. So in that first case of no orientation reversing fixed point, all solutions tend, sorry, all solutions tend to a fixed point. If there is an orientation reversing fixed point, then you have something like this, and here's the orientation reversing fixed point. What we'll do is we'll look at the second iterate, that says F2, sorry about the detail. The second iterate will look something like this. Okay, the maximum will map under one iteration somewhere down here. The pre-image of the maximum, somewhere around here, will map up there, that's this turning point. There's another pre-image of the maximum, which is um, somewhere down there. So if I start there, I go to the maximum after two iterations, so that's there. And it's monotonic on the rest of it, so it looks something like that. Okay. So what you can see is that the orientation reversing fixed point for F has become a non-orientating reversing fixed point for F2. And that's what we were saying before, that the second iterate of a decreasing map is increasing. Because okay, orientation reversing just means decreasing at, at, at the fixed point. Okay. So, if we look at the second iterate, we have something like this. Now, we have two alternatives. Since we have something like this, either it's as I've drawn it here, or this point comes out the bottom of the box. Okay, the box is based on the orientation reversing fixed point in its pre-image. And if you look in here, this looks unimodal, but of course it could be like that, it could be like this. It could go lower, it could go higher. Okay, but it's going to be unimodal. So, we have another dichotomy. Either F2 maps the box into itself or not. And it, I mean, sorry, box into itself. I hope it's obvious what I'm saying. You can write this down in mathematical language, but um, it's just saying what, where the image of the critical point is in relation to other things. So, let's suppose it maps into itself, then we ha do have this picture. If not, then this point is below this line here. And we're actually in the picture that I've drawn here. And you can see that restricted to the box, the image of this branch is the whole thing, the image of this branch is the whole thing, so we have a topological horseshoe um, for F. Actually, the second derivative has that nice property. Okay. But in that case, it's chaotic. 
and we have infinitely many periodic orbits and so on, and we're thinking about the things that are not chaotic. So if it's if the map if F2 doesn't map the box into itself, then the map's chaotic, and I'm not treating the chaotic case. If it does map the box into itself, then restrict it to the box, and actually there's an equivalent one here, like that, which are flipped between each other on every second iterate. We can ask the same question. Does the second iterate restricted to this box have an orientation reversing fixed point? Okay. And if it does, then we know it can't be the fixed point of F. So remember, the fixed point of F was orientation reversing fixed point, and the second iterate was increasing, so it's, so it's not an orientation reversing fixed point for F2. So if I do have an orientation reversing fixed point, as I do here, it's actually period 2 for F, which goes, and there's the other point, that fixed point there, which is also orientation reversing for F2, is a period two point. Okay. So now what we're doing, going to do is use induction on F, F2, and so on. So I can't remember how much I wrote down of this. Right. So the idea is that we, if we have an orientation, if we don't have an orientation reversing fixed point, okay, then we don't have. We don't have um, this point here. And so what have we got? Well, we've got this fixed point, And we could have another orbit of period 2. Okay, Just after the creation of the period, orbit of period 2, the second iterate, so if you like, it was looking like this. And now it's looking like that. And I've got a non-orientation reversing fixed point there which is not the fixed point of F. Okay, this is F2, restricted to the box. So if I can't renormalize, sorry, if I can't look at this, if I don't have an orientation reversing fixed point, then either for F2, then I have a fixed point for F and possibly an orbit of period 2, but not an orientation reversing period. Orbit. Period two. So I have period one or period two. Period one and possibly period two. If I have an orientation reversing fixed point, then for F2, then I definitely have period one, definitely have period two, and I now ask, do the same thing. I look at the second iterate of the second iterate. Okay, I play the same, exactly the same game here, but now on this little box. So that's looking at F2 of F2, which is F4. And I ask the same question. Well, if I have an orientation reversing fixed point, then it must be an orbit of period 4, period 2 for F2, period 4 for F, and I can look at F8. Otherwise, I have to stop, and I have period 1, period 2, and possibly period 4. So that's what we do. So third dichotomy in this little argument, either the induction process terminates or it does not. So if it terminates, then F, to the 2 to the m does not have an orientation reversing fixed point, and the only periodic points are those periods 1 up to 2 to the m, and possibly 2 to the m plus 1. Okay, that was that extra one that we added in down here, which was not an orientation reversing fixed point, but was a point of period 2. Okay. If it doesn't terminate, then f has orbits, then I have orientation reversing fixed points for f to the 2 to the k for every k, and that gives me period 2 to the k orbits for all k, and in the limit, typically, it's an attracting Cantor set. Okay, you, you can thicken it in various nasty ways, but um, typically, it's an attracting Cantor set. And that's the set at the accumulation period doubling. So um, period doubling, what you have is this 1, 2, 3, 4, sorry, 1, 2, 2 squared, 2 cubed, 2 to the fourth, and so on, accumulating and in the limit, we have this attracting Cantor set, which is the set that I get taking the limit of this process. And so you can see it almost in terms of this picture, in terms of, see, at this stage, the attractor is contained in two intervals, one here and one here. And so that's two. 
At the next level, the attractor is in four intervals. The next level, it's in eight. And so you take the intersection of the union of those um, intervals, and it's the standard cantor set construction, creating a cantor set exactly like the middle third, but with two, then four, then eight um, intervals. Okay. And that's the zero entropy. That was it. Okay. Either because we just had dichotomies, there was never other choices. You never had choices. It's either this or this or something that I hadn't thought of. It's either you have an orientation reverse fi fixed point or you don't. Okay. Then either the map was chaotic or the second iterate or the two to the kth iterate maps a smaller interval into itself. Okay, and so we had, sorry, I missed one. Either there's an orientation reversing fixed point, either it maps into itself, and then either the induction process terminates or it doesn't. So in all cases, we never had choices. We had simple dichotomies. Um, in two cases, well, one case, we, the original one, there was no orientation reversing fixed point. That was a stopping rule. There's nothing else interesting. We just got the fixed points in that interval. Okay. If in the second dichotomy, if it came out of the box, then we know the map was chaotic, which means it wasn't in the class that we were trying to classify, so we can throw that out. And the third case simply says, here are two sort of the interesting cases, if you like, for um, non-chaotic unimodal maps. Either you have orbits with period 1 up to 2 to the m for some m, okay, which is either m or m plus 1 in that term, or you have all periods 2 to the k and an attracting Cantor set. And that's it. Okay? There is nothing else. There, there were each dichotomies. We never had something that we weren't thinking about. Okay? End of story. Okay, so... It's a really, I think this is a really neat little argument. Okay? And so what it tells you is, if you have an orbit that isn't a period of 2 to the k, then you're not in either of these cases. And if you're not in either of these cases, you're chaotic. That was, that was the result. Okay? We allow m equals 0 here. If m equals 0, then you just have the fixed points. Okay. So... That was, so, the, you know, <laughs> that's a beautifully simple um, argument. And so, if you like, the, qu the challenge becomes, can you take that sort of argument and do it for the piecewise smooth cases? And this is what I was telling you about um, in the last lecture, that yes, you can, but instead of having just one renormalization choice that you can look at F2, you have multiple choices, and they can transfer. And when you looked in the box, the box was another unimodal map. Okay, so you didn't have to think about anything else. When you're looking at maps like this, like that, like that, is that? Hang on, sorry. So yeah. So the increasing, increasing case. Okay. When you iterate, you always have increasing, increasing branches. But as soon as you have at least one decreasing branch, iterating it twice makes it increase. Sorry, decreasing branch, iterating it twice makes it increase. Sorry, I should do that. Um, makes it increasing. Okay, so you so you have the idea that at least for the increasing two branch maps, we can use this sort of argument. Indeed, you can. But even then, it could be F, your renormalization, your um. Looking at f to the 2 here can be looking at f to the k for any k. That are even more, actually, there are even more complicated things. Once you lose symmetry, um, you don't even have to have the same number k on either side. And once you start looking at something like that, you have to include, if you're doing that, you have to include that. Oh, I can't do it. The, the one where you've reversed both, and the one where both are reversed, and the one where both are um, increasing. Because by iteration, you can get into these. So it becomes horrendously complicated. 
And then the nice thing about everything I'm doing here is because I have that full family result for the unimodal maps that I talked about, I know that I get all this stuff because I know everything possible happens. Okay. But once you go piecewise smooth, the full family results start to break down. There are some examples I can give you which are full families, but you don't know whether everything you're talking about exists in the example that you've got. And that's a really difficult problem. It's not enough just to say, oh, I've got a unimodal map. Oh, look at what unimodal maps do without wondering about whether, too much about whether my unimodal map does it. Because I have a full family argument which says, providing the map is, um, I think it's continuously differentiable, and the family is continuous in the C1 topology. So if I change the map a little bit at a given x, you, don't, you get a, a, a small change. Then it's full. Okay, if it, go, if it goes from one end to the other, everything that can happen in between um, does happen. So you've got this horrible extra complexity that you could have, as it were, holes in your actual example of things that you know could happen and do happen in some maps like your map, but don't happen in the particular map that you're looking at. So the piecewise smooth has that complication on top of everything. Okay, so I want to just sketch what needing theory does, because needing theory is wonderful and powerful, and I'm not going to talk very much about it. It's all the results that I'm going to talk about in one dimension, in some sense, are much, much more natural to do through needing theory. But I don't want to make this a needing theory course, partly because it's a completely one-dimensional theory, and I want to be able to talk about two dimensions too. But Needing theory is really just a way of labeling things. The early papers on needing theory said, I'll give this map F a symbolic, or orbits of it, symbolic description. I'm going to put a C if we're at the critical point. I'm going to put an L if we're to the left of the critical point. And I'm going to put an R if we're to the right of the critical point. So now I take a point, maybe it's to the left, so it starts L. I see where it goes to. Oh, it's still on the left, so it's L, L. And then it goes right, so it's L, L, R. So you build up a sequence of L's and R's that reflect the order of the, image, of the images. So you're looking at the images and you're asking which side of the, discount of the um, critical point do they lie on. And now you want, an, so now you've got symbol sequences of L's, C's, and R's. Now you want an order on those sequences that reflects the order on the real line. And in a sense, this is the fundamental thing. This is why this doesn't work in higher dimensions. Everything that you do using needing theory, almost everything you do using needing theory, requires the complete order on the real line. And you just don't have that in R2. You don't have, you know, what's, what order are you going to put points in the plane in? I mean, there are orders. You can define orders, but there's no natural order. Okay, so you've got these sequences L, C's, and R's. What you must remember is that if you're on an R, that's the negative slope bit. So if you're on an R, the order of points is reversed. So first of all, we'll say that L is less than C is less than R. Okay. And then what we'll do is we'll take two sequences, which are the same, up until some point. Now look at where they were the same on and ask, is there an odd number of R's or an even number of R's? If there's an even number of R's, then that iterate, that they're both on the same side the whole way through, so they never cross over the, the critical point in that first sequence of things. They're always on the same side. So the F to the N of that is monotonic because you've been on a monotonic branch every iterate. <laughs> and if there's an even number of R's, that's monotonic increasing. Because the, the pairs, the evenness, the pairs of R, iterates on R, have reversed and then anti-reversed. Okay? So in that case, F to the N, where N's the number that they agree on, is increasing. And in the increasing order, F is less than C is less than R. Okay? But if there was an odd, oh dear, if there was an odd, that should be odd, that's very odd, um, that second one should be odd, then 
you've reversed the order. So the smaller one is now higher. Okay? So what we say is R is less than C is less than L when we look at that last one, the one, the one that they differ, differ on, because you've reversed the order. So this gives you a, an order on the sequences that reflects the order of the points on the line. Okay. And there's one thing that you can see immediately if we have a, let's call it an interesting, an interesting unimodal map, by which I mean that f of c is bigger than c. If f of c is less than or equal to c, it's really boring. There are only critical points. But what you can see is that if f of c is greater than c, then there is a box which could include c or not. If it's not, it's very boring because you've got a monotonic bit, and we know monotonic bits are boring. Um, but if f of c is bigger than c, there's an invariant box like this. So this is f of c, and this is f2 of c. Okay. And the furthest you can, you have an attractor in here, the furthest you can go is f of c. So that means f of c is the furthest on the right. So that means if I take the needing invariant, so the needing invariant is the sequence I get from c, Let's call that capital K, is C, um, it goes then right, and then maybe it goes left, and then it goes and so on. Okay, so that's the needing invariant, what C does. So now I take the shift of C, you've seen shifts, all it says is rub out the first term. Okay, that is the needing invariant of F of C, the needing sequence associated with F of C. Because I started at C, I went to F of C, and so I just cross out that C, and this is what that does. So what you can see is that on a symbolic level, sigma k, this um, shift on the needing invariant, has to be the furthest to the right. It has to be the biggest of the, needing, of the possible um, sequences you get from points in there. In particular, it has to be the biggest of all the points that you get by looking at more iterates under k. So there's a slight thing about when, um, when c is, is periodic, which I don't want to go into it. But roughly speaking, what we must have, without any thought whatsoever, is that any shift of k, this sequence k, must be less than or equal to the shift of k. Shift of k is the furthest to the right point. Anything else is, is less than that. And again, roughly, there's a slight hand-waving about what you do with C, which um, is resolved in various different ways, which I don't want to go into, technical details. But, it, roughly speaking, anything that satisfies this, plus a little bit that checks that you're doing things sensibly when you hit C, is a possibility. Okay, Anything that happens must do that. And so the full family thing says, anything that does this, actually exists. So this is, plus the bit that I haven't said about consistency at C, this is a, um, a, sufficient, a necessary and sufficient condition for a sequence to be a, a needing sequence for a unimodal map. And the full family stuff says that if I have a nice families going from here to here, then I get all sequences between the two endpoints that satisfy that occurring. So nothing else can happen. Again, it's one of these really nice, powerful results, which are hard, very much harder in R2, in, um, sorry, in the piecewise smooth case. Right, I want to do just a bit more about this. So I've said that bit, really. So let's just think a little bit about the story that we were telling earlier about what can happen when you what this, we call this renormalization or induced map, when you can look at the second iterate or a more general iterate in here. So look, the second iterate restricted to this box, if I was to flip it, okay, R has, is labeling the negative slope bit, okay? C is the turning point, L is the positive slope bit. If you don't like that, flip it, do x to minus x or... Um, x to half minus x for this, I guess. 
so that you flip the picture and then it becomes a map as you had before. Okay. So now think about the needing invariant of this. This goes C, R, L, something, something, something. Okay. Now every time it, in the second iterate it does a C, in the first iterate it does C, R. Okay, so C in the second iterate is C, R in the first iterate. If I had an L in the second iterate, that's the increasing bit, it actually is on the right and does two R's. That's the decreasing, decreasing bit becoming increasing. So L in the second iterate actually means two R's in the first iterate. And R in the first iterate, in the second iterate, means it went L, R in the second iterate. It started on the left, and then it went right to become decreasing. So now you can say, suppose that the second iterate I start with C, in the first iterate I must start with CR. Now suppose that we were starting further up this induction chain, maybe the fourth iterate. So in the fourth iterate, if I start with C, the second iterate does CR. But then the third it, the, then the F itself does CR, LR. And now you can see as you're going further and further and further, being able to renormalize further and further and further, and then come back and see what it means for F itself. Well, what you're doing is each time I see, so first level I go for C, then I go to CR, then I go to CR, LR, then I go to CR, LR, RR, LR. Okay, that was R, R, sorry, R becomes LR, L becomes RR, R becomes LR. And then that becomes CR, LR, RR, blah, blah, blah. And then that becomes CR, L R R R L R L R L R R R L R R R L R R R L R L R L R R R L R etc. And that tells you, taking that limit, what you can see is the beginnings start the same, so it's tending to a limit. That tells you the needing invariant at the accumulation of period doubling, which is sort of cute. Okay, so it's, it's a, a labeling, and it also tells you quite a lot about the dynamic. Um, again, I don't want to go into that. So needing theory is this wonderfully powerful thing. The thing, um, yeah, the thing that is remarkable about this is the following. That this looks as though you're doing clever things with, with um, symbolic sequences. What Milner and Thurston, two of the best mathematicians in the 20th century realized was that you could do better than that. Instead of using R's and L, they used ones and minus ones. And they used ones for, so if you look at the first thing, you would put a one if you were increasing there and a minus one if you were decreasing. You look at the second one and you look at the second iterate and you put a plus one or a minus one depending on whether the second iterate is increasing or decreasing. Which is enough to tell you what the two, so if it was, say, minus one, one, well, a minus one tells you that you were at R. Okay, it started at minus one, which means negative slope. The one tells you that you must have done another R because the second iterate is increasing for a plus one. Okay. But the first iterate was in R, which is decreasing. So the second iterate must have been an R. So it's a totally equivalent thing, but now you're using ones and minus ones. Now, because I'm a pure mathematician, well, because they're pure mathematicians, they don't like working with symbol sequences, and so they thought about treating this sequence of ones and minus ones as a formal power series. So I'll take that one, and then I'll say it's minus one t, plus 1t squared, minus 1t cubed, minus 1t um, fourth, and so on. So I've now gone from symbol sequences of R's and L's to symbol sequences plus 1's and minus 1's to formal power series with coefficients plus or minus 1. It all sounds very fancy, and you can't understand at all why you do it. You then take the sequence corresponding to the critical point approached from below. Okay, you get different sequences if you approach from above or below. 
but let's approach it from below. So we've now got a simple sequence that we turned into a sequence of minus ones, which we turned into a formal power series. Well, how about finding whether there are any zeros of that formal power series? Why not? Zero. If the um, formal power series has a solution between a half and one, sorry, the, the, has a zero between half and one, so that T being half and one, let's call that S, then one, the unimodal map you've got is semi-conjugate to a tent map with slope S, and with topological entropy, log one over S. So the zeros of the needing polynomial tell you the entropy of the map for chaotic maps and tell you a model map, a tent map, which it's sort of equivalent to. I'll talk a bit about the equivalence. Okay. More than that, I said a semi-conjugacy. Conjugacy is about how you relate maps. Okay, so if you change coordinate, have you done, has anyone talked about conjugacies? Does everyone know what a conjugacy is? Conjugacy is basically a change of coordinate. So if I have a map F, which takes an interval I to itself, okay, and suppose I have a change of coordinate I H, which takes I to J. Okay? So I can ask, if I worked in these new coordinates, so I've got X here, and I've got Y here. So this means X goes to F of X. Well, what I would like to say is what is the point if, if this is a change of coordinates, so I have a change of coordinate here and a change of coordinate here, which y goes to the equivalent change of coordinate x? So it's, I'm simply saying, I'm sorry, I'm maybe making this overcomplicated. All I'm saying is in if I make a change of coordinates h, so y equals h of x, then what's the map f tilde down here that acts like the map f up here? That is the map. So if you just do the change of coordinates, oh, that's what I'm saying. Do the change of coordinates. And what you can see is it means that if I start at x and do f and then change coordinates, it's got to be the same as finding the change of coordinate y and going that way. So what we're saying is that if I do f tilde after h, so I do h first and then f tilde, then that's the same as doing um, h. So I did h first, sorry, yeah, f first and then h. So it's saying going down here and across here is the same as going across here and down here. That's what a change of coordinate does. Okay. So in these new coordinates, so what, what do you want of a coordinate change? Well, you want it to be invertible. Now, if it's differentially invertible, that's lovely. If it's only invertible without being differentiable, that's a bit messy because you can't, you're not very bad at writing down, um, down these things. Non-differentiable functions is hard to write down. There's an even worse situation where h is monotonic, but, not, but can have constant inter intervals. That means h collapses some points up here, a collapse to a single point down here. But I can still do this. It's just that some of the dynamics is collapsed. And that's a semi-conjugacy. So what Milner and Thurston proved in the late 70s, although it wasn't published until the late 80s, um, was this incredibly rich way of moving from symbol sequences that people have been playing with to formal power series, to actually using those formal power series to create, you can write down explicitly what this, this H is in terms of the needing invariant. Okay. And it's fantastic because actually it means that if you want to, and I've done this with a group in um, Valencia, if you want to calculate entropy accurately, 
that's equivalent to not doing complicated things with numbers of periodic orbits, but simply finding zeros of an appropriate um, polynomial. Which in many ways, is a much easier problem. Okay, you've got issues of how many terms you have to take and that sort of thing. But. So, where does that get us? I can't remember. It's fantastic, though. I mean, it's one of those things where you think, how on earth did anyone dream that up? But it's... It's basically seeing that what was happening on the symbolic level translated across to the functional level by choosing the right thing. And the point about choosing P, the, sorry, the needing polynomial, the polynomial associated with the critical point to be zero, meant that it didn't matter which way you were approaching the critical point, and that basically you closed up gaps, just having jumps. Right, okay. So I'm now going back to the Barcelona talks. So what happened historically... Oh, I'm not meant to be talker when I'm across the line, am I? Right. So what happened historically... Um, was... It was very strange, in, in the early 1980s, a variety of people were writing these absolutely amazing papers on one-dimensional maps, referring to a preprint by Milner and Thurston. And if you hadn't seen that preprint, everything they did was magical, and you couldn't imagine getting anywhere near it. Once you got your hands on that preprint, you realized that all they were doing was understanding bits of the preprint. <laughs> It was, it was um, I mean, I still remember when I first got my hands on it, I thought, oh, is that all? <laughs> you know, it's, it's just all these really complicated things. What I'm going to try to do, and what I've been trying to do a bit, um, so I should say, I had a PhD student in the, it was actually David Rand's PhD student in Warwick, but I was a postdoc there and took over a bit, who basically with him, we were looking at the needing invariants for the piecewise um, smooth cases, and we never published it because actually it all works perfectly. So we thought it was boring, because you can do everything that you can do for the um, unimodal maps, but you couldn't solve the full family bit, or at least we couldn't. So we never published it because of the bit that we thought was the, the bit that really said you could use this, we couldn't manage. Um, so. What, was, what else was I going to say about that? So, so you can do that, but the, the other thing is that you can start, once you know the answer, you can work out what you needed to do without using needing theory. So what I want to do is a bit of sketching. So this is going to be sketchy. It's not completely thought through, but it's basically trying to do Milner Thurston without doing anything complicated. Okay? Because actually the, the, the technical stuff that you need for Milner Thurston, it's not dreadful, but it, it's pretty, you know, it, it takes some thought and involves, um, you know, all sorts of strange sum, summing, um, I mean, Riemann type um, sums and, and all, all sorts of weird things come into it. So I don't want to get into that. So what I want to do is start thinking about, oops, I've, Let's, let's start thinking of not doing um, the needing theory. So in this bit, every now and again, things aren't going to be fully fleshed out, okay? Partly because I haven't got around to, to doing the full detail. All the theorems I say are true because I've done them using needing theory. What I'm trying to do is avoid using the needing theory. Okay. If you want the, the one place where all the needing... So for the monotonic monotonic branch maps, the needing theory is, quotes, simple. I mean, I not too bad. And Toby Hall and I did that in, I can't remember, the late 80s, and that is published in nonlinearity. But um, the, ge the general piecewise smooth case we ne was never published, as I say, partly because we weren't quite sure what the statement about which functions actually did what we were saying was. So anyway, here's, this is really setting up, now remember, there's a pause here, Where, how are we doing for time? Uh, right, so that's a good pause point, let's have a five minute pause.
and then we'll come back. And what I want to talk about now is, is technique and, and Markov partitions and that sort of thing. Okay. Right. So um, I'm going to restart two things that I probably should have said. One is that the um, PhD student in Warwick, whose thesis um, did the need theory for the um, two branch monotonic piecewise smooth maps, was Dan Berry. And the other thing is, that although it says here throughout the rest of the lecture, F will be a continuous map of R, think about where I actually use continuity. What you will find is I only use it on the on the on intervals. So I'm not actually I don't need continuity except on the intervals that I'm talking about. Okay. And in higher dimensions, all, almost everything that I say goes through just as easily, except instead of closed intervals, I've got to have some closed region. And instead of it's got to be continuous and it has to have, it doesn't, the map as a whole doesn't have to be invertible, but on the regions that I'm talking about, the intervals, I have to be able to take inverses. Okay. And of course, for continuity, that's not an issue. I can look at the set of pre images. Okay. For, now, right, so we'll say, let's suppose that I have two intervals. We'll say J, F covers K if K is contained in F of J. Okay, so all we're saying. Got two intervals. Um, I should probably say dis with disjoint interior, but here's J, here's K, and so we can draw J up here and K. And all it's saying here's that point, is that point, that point. Is that point, that point, is that point. All it says, if I look at F on J, it's got to map across the whole of K. It doesn't have to do it monotonically or anything. It just has to map across K. Okay. There's a particularly nice case when F of J equals K, and we'll come back to that one in a minute. Now, if... Um, a closed interval J covers itself, then it contains a fixed point. Okay, that's the intermediate value theorem. Because if I take an interval J and it covers itself, well, either this own point goes, well, you can choose a point in it which goes to the left, choose a point in it that goes to the right, and it's continuous in between. So look at F of X minus X. Um, let's, let's actually do this. Okay. Suppose F of J contains, sorry, K is, you know, contains J. Okay, J is contained in F of J. Okay, then the easiest case, well, no, I can actually do it. Okay, so there exists an X1 in J such that f of x1 is less than um, the left limit point a, b, a, there is s2 in j, such that f of x2 is greater than or equal to b. Okay, that's what it means to go across things. You've got to get over to the right and over to the left. <coughs> and of course, a must be um, less than or equal to x1, and x2 must be less than or equal to b, because they're in the interval j. Okay. So let g of x equal f of x minus x. And note, g is continuous, because it's sum of two continuous functions. So what's g of x1? Well, g of x1 is f of x1, which is less than a, minus x1. Okay, so, so it's something negative minus something bigger, so that's less than or equal to naught. g of x2 
is greater than or equal to naught. Okay, because f of x2 is bigger than b, x2 is less than b, so f of x2 minus x2 is bigger than or equal to zero. And so in between, intermediate value theorem implies there exists a y element of, well, between x1 and x2, i.e. in j, such that g of y equals zero. If g of y equals zero, then f of x equals x, or f of y equals y, and so y is a fixed point. That is almost the only thing that you need to know about Markov partitions and their use for finding um, periodic orbits. So, the type of thing that we're going to do is suppose that we have some set of closed intervals with disjoint interiors. Oh, and let's just note that if a region covers another region, okay, in higher dimensions, take the inverse and you've basically got a, a contraction, or not a uniform contraction, but you've got um, a region that is mapped inside itself. And so take a, not the contraction um, mapping theorem, but take a, any of your favorite general fixed point theorems. If you have a map of a set inside itself, then you have a fixed point. So that works in higher dimension too. So now, let J1 up to JM be some set of closed intervals, and I'll tell you, give you examples of how to do this in a second. A Markov graph of F is a directed graph with vertices 1 to M, and an edge from I to J, if and only if Ji F covers JJ. So it's a way of keeping track of what covers what. So you've got some set of intervals, you ask which ones cover which ones, if any of them do, and you then set up a graph, and I'll, I'll do this for an example. It's much it's these sort of irritating things where when you write things down, it looks really complicated. When you do it on an example, it's ridiculously easy. Um, and then we also associate a transition matrix with a graph, which is an M by M matrix with Tij equals 1 if Ji F covers Jj or 0 otherwise. So in other words, it's 1 if there's an edge from I to J. And I've gone theory. Let's, let's do an example first then, and then we'll zip back to the theory. So suppose you have an orbit of period three. Okay. Then here are the three points on the orbit of period three. We've got a continuous map. Okay. We've got these three points of period three. This one goes to there, this one goes to there, this one goes to there. Or this one goes to there, this one goes to there, this one goes to there, which is the same up to reversing the direction of x. So basically, for period three, we've got this really nice case where there's only one thing really to worry about. So suppose we have this arrangement of the points. Well, think of this interval i0. This point goes to the, this end point goes to there, this point goes to there, and it's continuous. The map is continuous. So I get everything between the endpoints. So that tells me that f of i0 contains i1. It might contain loads of other stuff, but it's got to contain i1. And now let's consider i1. So I've got an arrow from i0 to i1. i1, this endpoint goes to the furthest to the right, this endpoint goes down to the left. So the image must contain i0 and i1. So I've got an arrow from i1 to itself, and an arrow from i1 to i0. Okay. So, don't read the rest of it. My transition matrix says, from z the first thing, zero, I can get, can't get to myself. I mean, I might be able to, but I, it's not implied by the period three. I can get there, I, and from one, I can get to either place. Okay, so this is T, one, one, not equal to zero. This is T, zero, well, oh, it's bad. I hope it's obvious what I'm doing. I'm, I'm labeling by the sets, not by, not by the columns. Okay. So it's very, very, if you have something like a, a periodic orbit, it's very easy to set up this sort of arrow and work out what the smallest F-covering F transition graph would be. Now, where does that help? Well, if you, what you really want to think about is if we have this thing, we said I0, 
I1, and we've got an arrow I1 to itself, I1 to I0, probably easiest to use the 0 and 1, and I did that in later th things, but never mind. So what I'd like to know now is, could I go from I1, let's think of a path that's allowed by these arrows. Okay. Now, you can tell whether there's a path of length k from any two of your um, partition by just looking at the kth iterate of this, of this matrix. It's actually exactly what it says. It, it basically, if you think about the, the product of matrix as the product going down things, it's saying that, that if I can go from here to here, there's a 1, okay, and then I've got a 1 in the corresponding next place, and so a path in your graph, path allowed by these arrows, corresponds of length k, corresponds to a, so that should be a0, a1, up to a k minus 1, probably, sorry, my, it's a path from a0 to a k, if the appropriate, so to a1, yeah, that's, the k is right, um, if, if this is non-zero. And in fact, what it is tells you how many different paths there are. So it's a way of taking products of this matrix is a way of counting paths in this graph. So they're totally equivalent. Now, it's not sh hard to show, and it's just by deduction on the length of the path, that if there's a path of length A0 from, from K from A0 to AK in the graph, then there's an exist, there exists an L in the f initial um, set, JA0, such that F to the K L equals JAK. So you actually get a sub interval that is mapped onto the J. And the in between bits are in the in between sequences. Okay. And hence, if I go from A0 through different points, different bits of my things to back to A0 and have a path that's allowed by that, which is something in the trace of this matrix to the power of k, that then that's a closed path. And by the argument that we just made, by the intermediate value theorem, that implies the existence of periodic orbit. So the trace of iterates of this matrix tells you how many independent periodic orbits there are of that period, independent in the sense that they're going through the, the um, intervals in the same order. And this is the basic tool for, tool for proving classic theorems such as Sharkovsky's theorem. Okay, with Sharkovsky's theorem, you make various assumptions, you show that the graph must look in, have a particular form, and then you read off what periodic orbits it must have. Okay, I'm not going to do that. I did it in a graduate lecture in Cambridge, or a graduate thing in Cambridge in the, when was that mean, the late 1980s, and it was two lectures, of course. Two one-hour lectures. And it was one of my favorite bits. You know, it's, it's, it's one of those really, really nice, clean results just using this sort of um, tool. Okay. So what can we tell going back here? Well, we can either just look at the graph and say, well, look, there's a fixed point. That's I1 going to itself. Okay. Look, there's a period two. That's I0 going to I1 going to I0. There's a period three because I assumed there was a period three. Anything else, I can go lots of times around here and then hop across to I0 and come back. Okay. Each of those give me a closed path. And therefore, a periodic orbit, you have to worry about whether that periodic orbit could have a period less than the period it has. And that's why I chose not to go right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left. Because that just could be doing period two, period two, going backwards and forth on the period two. But if I do lots of times here and then do a little drift over to I0, then I know I'm safe. Okay. The other thing I could do is multiply up this matrix. So what happens if we do 0, 1, 1, 1 times 0, 1, 1, 1? What do we get? We go 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1. So we get that matrix. And what you can see is 
that there are three points of period two, the trace. So that's the fixed point, which is also period two, which is sitting in I1, and the point of period two. So it's telling you how many points there are. And that, sorry, uh, I'm going to be indulgent. Okay, so this allows you to prove a result in um, number theory called Fermat's Little Theorem. Because you can say, uh, maybe I'm not. I'm, I'm, no, I won't do it. It's, it's a th too much of a of a diversion. But but. Ba but basically, you can use the fact that you know that the trace of something splits up into um, periodic orbits to say things about how, how things divide. So, for example, and just very briefly, if I'd taken a map which was 1, 1, 1, 1, okay, which is, for example, 2x mod 1, 2x mod 1 or the tent map with, two, with 2x does that, then... Oh, I'm doing it, aren't I? Okay. T to the n is 2 to the n, no, t, um, n plus 1, is it? T is that. I, I think it's that. Okay, off the top of my head, it's that. Check, check what it actually is. Okay. Um, T is 1, 1, 1, something like that. Oh, no, I'm right. <laughs> That's better. Okay. So when n is... is it, no, it's not. When n is... is, is, is yeah, 2 to the n... What's my indice? So when n is 1, I want that. So it's 2 to the n minus 1. Aha. That's right. Okay. So when n is 1, it's this. The t is this. So that's my transition matrix, for example, 2x mod, mod 1, for example, the tent, tent map with slope 2. So it tells me that t to the n has 2 times 2 to the n minus 1 points of period um, n. Okay. So what's that? That's equal to 2 to the n points of period n. So suppose n equals p prime, bigger than 2, okay, an odd prime. Okay, so what do we have? We have 2 to the p points of period p, okay, just by looking at the trace. Now, because it's period p, it could either be a fixed point or it must be an orbit of period p. There are precisely two fixed points. So 2 to the p minus 2 are points of period p, not period 1. Okay, Because remember, a point of period 1 is period p2. So this equals 2 into 2 to the p minus 1 minus 1. So these points have to be on orbits of period P. Now, there's got to be just a whole number of such orbits. You can't have a half of an orbit of period P. So in other words, this is divisible by P. But I've said P is a prime bigger than 2, so 2 is not divisible by P. So 2 to P minus 1 minus 1 is divisible by P, okay, which is Fermat's little theorem. So that's a dynamical systems proof of a number theory result. And actually, at the moment, there's quite a lot of interaction between number theory, not, not um, quite that basic, but number theory and dynamical systems that's being used to, to develop ideas in various different ways. So Horseshoe. F has a horseshoe if there exists a closed interval J0 and J1 with distant interiors, such that J0 covers both J0 and J1, and J1 covers J0 and J1. So you have exactly the transition matrix I wrote down there. The first one covers both, the second one covers both. 
Okay? And that means you have the number of periodic points of period um, n grows like 2 to the n. So if you like, the growth rate of that number is log 2, which is the entropy of the map. Um, OK, so existence of horseshoe, then any sequence of noughts and ones is allowed. Because from 1, I can get to 1 and to 0. Sorry, from the first place, I can get to the here or there. Second, I can go from here to here. My mark of my um, graph looks like I0, I1, or Js. We've got Js, doesn't matter. All possible sequences are allowed by the graph. And you can actually prove, again, it's by a little induction, that for any sequence um, allowed, even infinite sequences, there exists a point that does that. Again, it's very simple, real analysis. So all, so the reason this is called a horseshoe is that all possible sequences of zeros and ones are allowed by um, the graph, okay, which is effectively what happens in the smell horseshoe in, in, two, in two dimensions. And we'll say that f is chaotic if some iterate of n, f to the n, has a horseshoe, which is what we did a bit earlier today. Okay, so period three implies chaos, Lee and York. We have period three, I0 and I2, f2 cover themselves. So f2 has a horseshoe. You can see that two ways. The f2, um, have I lost it? I haven't. I rubbed it out. F2 has non, it was 1, 1, 1, 2. Okay, so each um, entry is non zero. That means you can go from anywhere to anywhere. Okay, or you can just think, oh, well, to, after two iterations, I can, from I0, I can get back to itself, or I can get to I1, one of those and one of those. From I1, I can get back to myself by going around that twice or by going backwards and forwards. And I can get to I0 by going around that once and then going across. Okay, so F2 has a horseshoe, and therefore that map's chaotic. Now, Lee and York actually made much more subtle distinctions between different ways of chaotic, being chaotic, but there you go. Right. Now, this is the important point. We only need F to be continuous on the intervals F, J, K, what happens between those intervals is immaterial, okay, if we're just concentrating on those, which means that we can develop these methods in piecewise smooth systems. Okay. And let me just indicate the first, and if you like, the most easy application of this. And the sort of thing that, you know, again, if you're, if you're considering examples, it's the sort of thing, an early thing that you might do. Again, can you find somewhere that you can say almost everything about? So, for example, suppose I had a, an interval, and I have now, C is now going to be a discontinuity. So, actually, I think of this as C minus and C plus. And let's suppose that the map does something like, oh, I don't care. Um, what am I going to do? Let's make it do something like. That. And this one, let's do the whole, whole way down. Except let's, let's make it a proper discontinuity. So whether, the slopes here don't matter. What matters is that C minus goes to the end point of the interval. So C minus, let's do the C minus in red. C minus goes to the end point of the interval. Okay, what does C plus do? C plus goes to the endpoint of the interval. Right. 
what does this point do? Well, it goes to a point here between C and the endpoint, and then maps to C. So there's a point here, and it goes like that and like that. And what about this endpoint? Well, it's fixed. Okay. So I have three natural intervals, I1, I2, and I3. So let's label, I'm going to do one, two, and three. If I'm in I3, right, remember it's, this is C plus, so I3 I'm thinking about C plus. That point stays there, this point goes down to the end. Okay. So in other words, I get everything. So I have an arrow to everything. If I'm here, this point goes to here, this point goes to here, so I1 goes to I2. If I'm in I2, this point goes to C, is C minus, so it goes all the way up to the top. This point goes to C. So I2 goes to I3. So my graph is like that. And now it depends very much what you want to ask. But you can already see that you can do a period three loop here. You've got a period two loop here. You've got a period one loop there. So there are all sorts of things where you can go start at two, backwards, forwards, forwards, round the loop, forwards, do this for a while, complete the loop. You've got loads of periodic orbits. Okay. If you want to know more, you can either try to enumerate them just by following your fingers, or you can write down the transition matrix and multiply it up. But already you can start seeing, um, I mean, basically, in some sense, this tells you all about the periodic orbits that are there. And I suppose the point is that it, it takes into account the, this special feature of this map was that the both critical points were pre-periodic. Okay, so it, they were either periodic or tended to a periodic point. And when, oh, sorry, they both, um, the, the discontinuity approach from either side was either periodic or pre-periodic. -pre and that's what allowed me to do everything. And because it's monotonic on these, I've got no straggly bits that I haven't considered. So effectively, the set of periods is the set of periods allowed by this. I might have, because I could make the map wobble in all sorts of ways, keeping it monotonic, I could create some of them stable, some of them unstable. I'm not talking about stability. In terms of existence, this tells me everything. Okay. So what I want to do in the first half of the next lecture is in some sense generalize that idea. Okay, So I want to do two things actually. I want to first of all do the tent map properly so you can actually see an inductive process of describing the dynamics and then I want to um, I want to take this idea and say how far can I push it? Okay, what, what's, what's the game? Um, and I'm going to do that without using needing theory. I'm going to say, needing theory does allow you to do this, but um, once you know the answers, you can do things without getting quite as technical. The other thing is that if you had regions, so if you're in higher dimensions, you had regions that mapped over each other in this way, you'd have exactly the same graph, and you'd have exactly the same conclusion, okay, providing the, the boundaries map to the boundaries, and you, you were considering everything. <clears throat> what I'll do in the last lecture is I'll show you an example in two dimensions where you can construct a Markov partition that does something that people weren't expecting these things to do. Okay, or where it, that's maybe a stronger statement than it's actually the case. Um, where we could confirm that something was possible that hadn't been possible to confirm otherwise. And it, it's exactly this idea of 
choosing things in some nice way that you can keep track of all the dynamics. Okay, so this this is this Markov partition idea, and in particular the case when you map onto each successive interval as you do here, is very very strong. Allows you to basically say everything modulo stability and modulo numbers of periodic orbits of the same topological type by going through the intervals in the same way, it allows you to say everything about the dynamics. Okay. Now, sometimes that's useful. Sometimes it's not what you're actually after. What I often find is something like this helps me say, oh, what's happening? You know, what type of things should I be looking out for? If I'm trying to do something general that this doesn't fit into, then I should stop. Okay, so it gives me it gives me examples where I can do everything. And in the unimodal map, these these sorts of things are called Mizerovich points. And they were precisely the points at which the first results proving the existence of invariant measures by properly chaotic attractors were, were done. Because you can then employ the ergodic theory for the symbol sequences allowed by these to create a measure that then pushes back to a measure on the interval. So it's very powerful, but very particular. So don't go around expecting all your maps to fit into this. But when they do, it's an incredibly strong way of sort of looking at things and, and understanding what goes on. So that's, is that tomorrow? I guess that's tomorrow. Um, yeah, so, so tomorrow we're going to finish one dimensions, start two, and then we'll finish with two and then in the last lecture. Okay, so um, I guess I'll see everyone at seven. <laughs>